no, it's a brilliant presentation, and I think it uh, highlights the, uh, the this idea that we're generating ever more streams of data and information, and it generates lots of questions. And it's a quite an interesting opportunity, I think, for the whole market research industry to help people solve and answer these questions. I think it uh, presents an optimistic viewpoint of, 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 our, of roles for us, everyone in this room in the future, to help un untangle some of these mysteries. And, and I think we're still going to be very much having to rely on, on, on often very traditional market research techniques. And I'm here today to talk about the work we're doing to try and modernise our online survey output because um, we're on a bit of a quest to try and uh, get everyone around the world to produce more modern surveys. Um, we analysed the survey output of our, of our clients around the world and I, I, I estimate that about half the surveys we produce right now are, are what we describe as modernised. Um, and we're, we're setting a goal to reach the 80% mark by the end of the year. Um, and so I'm on a bit of a global road trip in a sense to go and evangelise the techniques of modernisation and, and explain why we're doing that and why we think you need to do that. And this presentation has really covers that whole topic off. Um, firstly, I want to sh tell you what I think a modern survey is, um, why you should do it, and then some of the things I think you should be thinking about and, uh, and explore some of the things we're doing to modernise our survey output. Um, how we define a modern survey is essentially one that's mobile adaptive, um, works on mobiles, it's the most critical thing I think. Um, short, we're setting target lengths of survey to around about 15 minutes. Um, the third element is more engaging, one of the challenges we have is an ever more distracted uh, audience based taking surveys so we have to <coughs> put more effort to make our surveys more of an engaging experience for people and so we're putting benchmark standards on Simple things like completion rates. We're trying to have a, a, a target completion rate of 85% of people who start a survey finish it on all devices that we uh, operate on. And the final part, which is probably a bit more nebulous, is, is trying to work out how to uh, generate more truthful answers out of people in our, in our research <coughs> and, and, and applying some of the learnings out of behavioral science over the last few years to, to improve the way we ask questions. Um, so the case for modernisation, I don't think need to dwell upon, everyone's probably conscious of it, everyone's um, using their, their mobile phones now mostly to, to, to do surveys on, there's a huge amount of demand to do surveys via mobile devices, but the challenge is that a lot of the surveys we produce are not very mobile friendly. And roughly speaking, at a global level, only about half or, or maybe about 60% of the surveys we produce are, are what we call mobile friendly. And what we're finding is a massive class divide emerging from the, from the clients that are producing surveys that are mobile friendly and the ones that are not. The ones that are not are languishing behind. And we're seeing a big divide of the people doing surveys on different devices. The younger, more mobile and active people are, are choosing to do their surveys on mobiles and the older, more, you know, more traditional groups of people are doing it on PCs. And, we're, and so, the, the people who, are, who haven't modernised their surveys that uh, are still languishing in creating these long, boring surveys that don't work on mobiles, uh, they're, they're having real challenges in reaching certain target audiences, and, uh, and it, that problem is only going to increase in the future. Um, I, I, I looked at uh, 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 the most recent survey I could find that we run on a big scale in South Africa, and over half the completes were by a mobile device. And, and you know that's a challenge for a lot of our clients right now. Um, uh, this is the demographic divide between um, people who complete surveys on a smartphone and on a PC. You can see it's uh, only 7% of people completing a, a survey on a, a, a PC these days are under 20, uh, 34. It's a massive old age bias to it. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, there's no way you can handle it. You can't just wait the, the data, let's upgrade and have extra people um, do our surveys from that age group on our, on our PC because they're, they're completely different people as well. They have different attitudes. This is the musical taste differences between a group of people completing a survey on a mobile and on a PC. They're completely divergent, as you should imagine. So our message is, is that unless you mobilise your surveys in the, in, the, in the years ahead, you'll have become an instant dinosaur, research dinosaur. Um, <laughs> So our, one of the things, that one of the big steps that we've, that we've made over the last year or two is to try and upgrade our survey technology to help us do that. Um, and um, the, uh, 
you know, the, the key thing is in, in uh, delivering surveys that work on, on mobiles, a lot of people talk about length and making them shorter. It's actually about the efficiency of the survey technology you're delivering them on. When we asked people why they weren't completing surveys on, on, on their mobile, a lot of it was to down design issues, technology not working, slow to load and so on. So what we've done is had a ground up overhaul of our survey delivery platform for delivering surveys on mobile using a lot more lighter, uh, the, the latest JS uh, 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 React code to make our, our survey interfaces more, more nimble, less server calls, um, more efficient. Um, using, uh, we, we are adhering now to Google material design standards to, to make the, the, the visual look and feel of our service consistent with what people expect on other types of um, things that interact by their mobile, things like Facebook and so on. We, we're using essentially the same language, visual language. Um, and we've done an awful lot of work to try and create more space optimized question formats that fit more naturally onto mobile screens. Here's some examples. I mean, one of the commonest things you face when the first thing you have to do when you're creating a survey on a mobile is ask people their age and you've got two choices you've got clients that want to know the exact age you can ask people to type in a box their age and a lot of people just don't like right up front typing something it's off-putting you lose one or two percent of the uh, of panelists who don't want to do that the alternative is to present people with a massive great big long list and if you're in your 70s or something you have to scroll down like this <laughs> <laughs> so we've introduced this wonderful little question, just a tiny little refinement that's made, made, made a difference between all sorts of different questions. It's called option nesting. So when you click a choice like this, you, then you have a little subgrouping, you select it, and two clicks, I've got your age without any form of scrolling. Um, things like sliders, a very nice question, intuitive question format to use on a mobile screen, but you don't have very much width space to move a slider, and sometimes it's not it's a bit unclear where you are on the scale so we're using a lot of what we call animated slider effects that uh, sort of emphasize and animate where you are on a scale to make these sorts of questions more intuitive and friendly for people doing on mobile phone other simple things like in, in the olden days when you ask people to, to rank things people would do things like drag options into boxes first second and third and so on well you simply don't have the space for the drop zones on a mobile so we've got things like click cranking so the first thing you click on gets stamped as one two three so on. just a lot more space friendly and then we're playing around a lot with lots of more creative ways of asking questions that are more space efficient that don't um, you know use up a lot of space and collateral this is a nice one we've got called collapsing grids and as you answer it it stamps your choice on the options so you can see what you've had answered for previous questions. It's a really nice little neat question that people quite enjoy answering. Um, and, and these sorts of changes have transformed the experience for our panellists around the world. We, we audit how much people enjoy doing our service on different devices. And, and, and the step change improvement we've had achieved by introducing these new tools into the mix has really uh, enabled us to produce more consistent quality across the board and it's opened up um, in the last year, we managed to double the number of surveys we've been building with are delivering um, above a certain threshold of mobile completes. And it's also improved our KPI internal design standards, these tools that we've created. We do a lot of work to try and orchestrate and control the look and feel and design that, so our programmers who design the service don't have to get fretting in the detail of what it's going to look like. We've got centralised intelligent rules to lay out the, 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 the look and feel of questions because often you have to muck around with that on uh, different types of screens um, and that is uh, having that in place has improved all our performance KPIs we're turning around and producing service more efficiently that's a bit of a brag I suppose but our, our standards are, are going up all, across the board with these new tools but it's not just that I mean having the tools is one thing it's also the types of questions we're asking in surveys we have to have a bit of a rethink over things like this the seven point scale <laughs> uh, where you, t you upgrade the survey, you get the data back, and you think, oh no, no one strongly agrees with this question. <laughs> <laughs> because it's off the screen and you can't fit off the seven points on the scale on the mobile screen. So, uh, so we're having to go back and encourage all of our clients to use five point scales. And then we went and we told our clients, okay, you've got to use five point scales. And then what that, what's happening is, is that they, they have their data in a nice horizontally aligned five point scale on a on a PC and then they run it on on the mobile and again the data is completely different because you're much more likely to click something on the top of a, of a vertical scale than you are 
when it runs horizontally. Um, and so we're seeing sort of 15% plus shifts in data by flipping the data between the two. So you get this horrible inconsistency. So what we, we've been trying to do is pioneer um, more sort of space efficient approaches to asking scale questions. For example, we, you know, introducing things like top labeling and using icons and visuals to make it easier uh, uh, to, to answer a, a scale like that on a mobile phone screen and it provides consistent data, PC and the mobile. Those sorts of things that we're having to think about all the time. Whenever we're upgrading a survey to try and make it more mobile friendly, but I'm constantly con confronted with lots of little nitty gritty issues like that. Um, but, you know, the simple fact is, is that I can produce the most perfect survey, I know it works technically brilliantly on a mobile, but no matter what I, I do, I, I still see higher dropouts on a, on a, a people completing it on a mobile than I do on a PC. This is, uh, this is probably the best, most optimized survey I've ever run, and you can see the differences in dropout, you're seeing a, a sort of a divide emerges in and simply, people's attention spans on mobiles and tablets is shorter, so we're going to have to make our survey shorter. One of the biggest problems is, um, I, I think down to second screening, um, here's a group of people answering a survey on a PC in the morning, and look at, this is the time they're spending answering in milliseconds each question in the survey along, you can see the, the distribution of, of, of how long each person's spending. This is the same survey being asked in the evening by a group of people answering it on a tablet in front of the television. And you get these horrible... <laughs> and they're, basically, they're just constantly being distracted by something else to do. And what you've got to recognise is that our survey is actually in competition with, pe with, with other forms of entertainment. And, and so we have to have a complete re-evaluation of what a survey experience is to try and maintain people's concentration. We've got to think about making our service more optimal, less annoying um, to do. Um, so one of the things that we, we also spend an awful lot of time uh, doing is trying to work out how to optimize the survey experience for people. And there's lots of uh, techniques. The average survey we produce around the world as an industry is 21 minutes long, which is just too long. And we're trying to get it down to around 15 minutes. There's lots of analytical techniques that you can use that we're developing to help shorten surveys. Once you have um, data back from a survey, we, what we thoroughly recommend is a more agile approach to running a survey. My, my rule of thumb is, is if you're sampling more than 500 people, always test your survey on 100 people first, pause it, take a look at what optimization opportunities there are in the surveys to make it a little bit shorter. And there's some very simple things, for example, you know, how many people have clicked on an option? If you're interviewing 400 people, what's the statistical threshold that's worth us gathering? If anyone says select less than five options, I can't do anything with that statistically, so let's sweep away anything that hasn't been clicked on very much. Look at questions that are giving very similar answers. We do a lot of correlation analysis, and it's a very simple procedure to run, and we've, got, we've developed a sort of press button analytics process to, to produce this type of information. Um, to, to, you know, and you can do it in SPSS with a press of a button as well. Look at the relationship between how one, one person's answering one question and another, and when they're correlating, you remove the questions that are overlapping and giving very similar answers. Um, I look at one of the common things I look at is the answer balance on scales. Often you see this situation where everyone's answering at the top end of the scale. And that's a bit of a waste of someone's time to ask a range question when everyone's answering at one point in the scale. You may as well just ask that as a yes, no. So we, we, you know, we might clean away that type of question. What we're looking for is questions with nice answer balance. There's lots of other nerdy things we do. Um, <laughs> this one's important. We, um, you know, there's a, there's a, you always say, well, uh, always ask, well, how many people do you need to commit the survey? You, you, you say, well, 400. And um, uh, that drives me a bit nuts because the number of people that need to complete every question is unique. And there's some pretty simple bits of statistical analysis you can work out with 100 responses. How many people need to answer that before you get a stable answer? And for a typical Likert scale, it's anywhere between, between 70 and 10,000, depending on what you're trying to do. It varies dramatically. And across a survey, you look at, you analyze how many people really need to answer. You realize it. Some require tiny numbers. And so by better organizing the structure of your survey, well, one of the things we do a lot with longer surveys is we'll, we'll do the, uh, 
the questions that need a lot of people answering at the beginning, and then the, the questions we need less people answering, we divide up into sections, and some people do some bit, and some people do other bits. Really, really fantastic op options to optimize in, in, on that sort of level. So, analytics is really important, and we're, we've got lots of tools we can advise on that type of thing, if anyone wants. <coughs> we tend to get involved in any sort of major project that we're running across the group, and, and we step in and have to do this. It is a little bit nerdy, but it's quite useful. There's some lot more practical things that you yourselves can do, uh, and it's sort of like a, a critical evaluation process when you're writing a survey. And there's a couple of things I want you to sort of emphasise. I always want you to think when you're writing a question, what strategic decisions are going to be made with the answer to that question? Because if you take a typical piece of market research that's got whatever you know, two or three hundred questions in it, and then you look at what it produced the PowerPoint presentation that's delivered with the results. You've thrown mostly about 80% of the data away because it's not very interesting once you get the data back. And when you've analysed it, you're only using a small fraction of the data uh, moving forward. And I ask you to do that thought experiment about what am I going to do with this data? Is it going to be useful? Uh, uh, there's some obvious things like uh, the pat on the back question that delivers, user, the, the, the delivers data that the marketing team could feel great about. <laughs> But you can't do anything strategically with. So, like, you know, my hotel scores seven out of ten. Great. The first ten people that walk into my hotel, I get an average of seven out of ten rating. What am I going to do with that information? Do I need to ask the next hundred people that come into my hotel that same question? Is it going to change much? No. Let's move on and ask something else. The next people. And you think about. The, the real intrinsic value of information, what, you're gonna, what decision you're going to make using that information. Mm. Um, uh, uh, this is something, whenever I go through a survey, I go sort of redlining and looking for things that I, uh, that, uh, that I think that could be obvious. This is one of the most common things. One of the challenges you have on a mobile phone is you simply cannot fit lots of range choices. Mm. And so I, so I so often see these sorts of really stupidly long range choices. And you go back to the client and say, are you going to do a cross tab that compares the people that have a cup of coffee once every two, two to three weeks with the ones that have them once a month? Because it, is that a really important distinction for you? No, but if not, just sort of crop it down. Um, this is a misplaced chart, but this is my point about not everyone needs to answer every question, break it up into chunks, and maybe ask some people some of the smaller things, less, less important if the things. So, okay, you could think about entirely about its length, let's get this shorter and shorter. When actually you analyze where people are dropping out of surveys, it's actually not actually specifically length per se. When I the, you, if you look at uh, the dropout of, of, of the survey, it's not like a straight line, they're dropping out this rate per minute. A dropout looks like this. It's very lumpy when you, when you uh, look at the dropout per second. It, you get these peaks and troughs at various points in the surveys. And when you start forensically analysing those points and saying, what's happening there? It's repetition points. It's banks of Leichhardt scales. It's long lists. You can classify these as annoyance points in the survey. When they're being asked the same question again, it's the point at which they'll drop out. And so what I, um, I, t I think it's really useful protocol when you're analyzing, really want to understand what's going on in surveys. You, you time up, uh, um, uh, analyze it, look at the dropout rate per second, basically look at how many people dropped out on a question and how long it took them to, to answer that question, that gives you the dropout rate per second. I could summarize these as two things, <laughs> repetition and lots of reading are the two biggest causes of dropout in survey. so uh, 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 those things I want to very specifically focus on. Repetition is a one of the big, is probably the biggest killer of completion rate of the survey, and so wherever possible, I try and avoid long banks of repetitive questions. This is something that I, I rail against. Is um, one of the questions we run a lot is basically you after banks of questions about you know the brand I use, and you often do it with loops of brands. Whereas you, if you actually think about it, you can unpack that and ask people it in a more monadic way. You ask people what brands are you not aware of, then uh, 
which do you, do you use? And if they use more than one, you then just ask them an extra question, which do you use most often? And then anything they haven't selected, after that you say, have you tried, tried any of the other, other brands? And then at the end you say, if the ones you haven't tried and used, would you consider trying? Now, it has a narrative flow to that, less repetitive. And when we do a head-to-head -head experiment, we, we, we go from 4% dropout sometimes down to zero, that type of technique. Now, I appreciate that you can't always apply that approach, but I want you to always bear in mind, is there a better way of asking a repetitive set by unpacking it? Um, one of the um, biggest challenges that we all face is dealing with lots of reading in a survey. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information often we have to get people to process in a survey. Um, if you analyse how long it takes to complete a survey, about 60-65% of the time is spent actually reading choices. So one of the simplest things you can do is you know, make it simple to read, strip away any verbosity. Um, but often uh, I see situations like this where you're asking people a loop of questions. So first of all, it's a frustrating process to ask a loop of questions. And you're asking, you're presenting people with option choices not really relevant to the thing you're asking about. Um, this is something I, I picked out from a survey where they're asking about what, uh, where they bought various different products. And they range from cigarettes to, to, to cans of Coke and so on. In this case, they're asking about yogurt. And, and they hadn't really thought about well, where can you buy yogurt? Can you buy yogurt in a, in a, you know, take, in a, a, a So, it's such a simple thing to have a critical eye of what you're asking and using intelligent uh, filtering protocols to make sure you avoid essentially unnecessary reading for panellists. And it sounds... I, 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 in every survey I ever look at, I can find this type of thing going on where people haven't really thought about you know, why do you need to, you know, that you know, it's inefficient. Sometimes you simply cannot, you know, you, you cannot reduce the length. Um, and you have situations like this. This was a music survey we were looking at, and they, they, they didn't really didn't want to lose any of these choices. But, but this, was, this question was causing dropout. A lot of actually cognitive processing involved in reading through and understanding what each thing meant. And so one of the things we're big fans of is uh, what we call intuitive grouping. Um, which is essentially, in this example, um, grouping by preproposition set. So, you know, the word while um, and then what are all grouped in a set. Uh, it, you cut out some reading time for people, and it's a lot more intuitive for me to answer these in group sets like that. When you compare the two questions, the first approach gets an average five selections and takes 36 seconds for someone to read through and process an answer. By grouping, you get more selections, less time. <laughs> People select more in less time, and you get less power. So that's a win win type protocol. So there's a lot more sophisticated approaches we use using statistical analysis when you to, to group things. You can do things in lots of different ways, but it's a really nice little trick there. And that's one of the first things I do when I see a long list is try to work out how to cluster group it like that. So, okay. You've uh, you made the survey shorter, you've got, you, you're on the best platform to deliver the survey. Everything's really great. Uh, the next thing is thinking about how you engage people in the survey experience. Um, when you analyse where people are dropping out, the, the vast majority of the drop-up actually occurs at the very beginning of the survey where people make an assessment of the experience. So I'm a big advocate of um, thinking about the opening part of the survey almost like an advert for the experience. Um, and thinking about how you're grabbing people's attention and getting them wanting to be interested in, in completing the survey. And I, I, I don't want to dwell upon this because I, I mean, I've been talking about this for about a decade, but and we've got lots of papers about this whole topic. There's loads of great ways you can start surveys to engage people. A really great question, I think, is a really good way to start a survey. Like, what is the secret? of a great shampoo. Um, that's a lot more interesting uh, question to think about answering and thinking you're going to be answering about than please take part in this shampoo brand tracker. <laughs> uh, what brand of shampoo are you wearing? But with that, uh, with that opening line, you could basically say, OK, well, you can build a narrative around that. You can say, OK, you know, first of all, what shampoos do you use and, and aware and what do you like? And so you can ask the brand tracking questions, but framed in a slightly different way with a different narrative approach, you can get people more willing to participate and give their thoughts and opinions. 
People like to be in charge, we discovered, you know, make them the boss, make them decision maker. Um, we, all, we often find asking a really sort of interesting question, uh, you know, this one, uh, which celebrity has the nicest teeth was a precursor to a survey about toothpaste. Um, when you're interviewing business people, just the mise-en-scene and the appeal, a visual appeal of a survey can have a really impact on people's you know, willingness to participate, they think it looks important. Any form of visual human face makes a survey more engaging. Um, on a broader level, narrative is something I'm really, really, I mean, I do a lot of time, my thought is writing a survey narrative, almost like a storyline, um, and, and trying to dis, a lot of surveys are just a random cluster of questions, trying to build a, build a storyline to understand where they're going with that. Uh, and uh, I, I'm a big fan of doing things like back waiting, when, when they're getting, losing attention, putting the interesting stuff at the end. And then having voluntary tasks at the end is also going to be very powerful, getting people to do stuff as an extra producing bonus. Um, there's lots of uh, these techniques that you can use within the body of the survey. You can think almost about every part of the survey as a little bit of a, of a sort of a, an advertising challenge. And so what we like to do often when you have a longer survey is, is, to, is use things like what we call thought starters, <laughs> dotted throughout the survey. They're, these are questions you don't necessarily want to know the answer to, <laughs> but engage people in the topic. So. Um, this was a whole load of questions about how about conscientiousness and how tidy your house was. So we said, well, if the Queen was coming to do, how long would it take to, to tidy up your house? Which is an interesting question. This was a, a set of questions asking about attitudes towards uh, risk taking, and we showed them, you know, just a, an emotive image there. Then at the end of that process, what we really like to do is give people feedback. Um, telling people what we've learnt, because I think if you talk to people about doing the survey, they feel like a lot of the information is going into black hole. And once you start making it more conversational, and you know this leads to the value of chat boxes, if it, they feel like they're having more of a conversation, you, you know, you're, you're, oh, this is what we've learnt. Is this right? Do you think this is right? Asking people to self-validate the feedback you, that you've learnt from them, they feel like that, that um, it's more important. And they, what we find is, is that it helps them concentrate and, and, and be more motivated to answer. So. We do an awful lot of surveys now when I get involved in designing a survey, what I'll do is try to break it up into little chunks and think about points at which I can give feedback that will engage people. This is something we did, a, 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 a drinks diary um, protocol where at various points of the survey we were giving them feedback like this. And they're very simple, basic bits of feedback. This is sort of scale responses you are in this type of group type of information. A little bit of a, a pen portrait of them at the end of the process. Um, and these sorts of things can have such a really great impact on improving um, how much actually effort people put into answering the questions. This is an experiment we did where we had a survey with or without some of these things. And what we found is, is that actually they spend more time answering the survey, which goes counterintuitive to what I'm saying about shortening, but um, they, were, it, they were doing it willingly. Less people were dropping out. And at the end of the process, we had a lot more uh, people willing to do more work at the end of it. So. These sorts of bits of feedback, oh, they do take some creativity sometimes to design, <coughs> and you don't necessarily have time when you're churning out a little survey, but for anything of a major scale, it's really valuable. Um, at the heart of this approach is, is gamification, and, and I can't do a presentation without talking about this, because it's been something that I suppose is my uh, sort of most known for topic. I just highlight what, it, what is gamification, and what, it's a science really, of understanding how to make something's work into something that's less work-like. And you can turn almost any survey question into a game if you understand the science of it, which is essentially voluntary, make it voluntary. We're much more willing to do something voluntary if, than, than having been forced to do it. Um, giving uh, the, the, the question purpose, making them understand why you need to know what you need to know, the, the value of that information, Applying rules to contain the task, unabandoned questions that ask people to do things that they don't know they have, where the beginning or end is become very difficult. When you contain a task with rules, and nearly all the best games are actually made up of what might be quite silly rules. So if you think about, the, the, the one I always exp uh, use is, is golf, which is essentially asking sort of middle-aged men to carry a heavy bag around for two hours. 
but, but they have these little rules along the way. You have a ball and a stick, and you have to get, and it's like this: it transform. Football, football is like how do you persuade young kids to run around for an hour? What you what you do is you create these two things at one end of it, and you have, and it's like just silly rules. Things. I'm trying to get my son to walk to the shops, and he's getting frustrated, and so I say, okay. See if you can get to the, uh, 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 to the shops without stepping on a line. That's a rule that makes the journey of doing this work more fun. So understand the value of a rule, uh, and rules can be very abstract in some, in some respects. And then make the process rewarding, and that can be by giving them feedback, but it can also be intellectually rewarding to answer questions that, that they find interesting to, to self-discover themselves about. Um, and this is, in a nutshell, Two examples. The first question is work. Second question is a game. Please is a word that actually I don't uh, recommend you use in a survey because it, it, it's, it, it's highlighting the fact that you're asking them to do something that's work. Uh, make a list of all your favourite shops is an unbound protocol. You don't know where that begins and ends. So that is uh, subconsciously to a, a respondent work. And when you're asked to do work, you try to do as little as possible. The second question uses the word imagine, which is a lovely word. I like using the word, it's a voluntary protocol. You're not being forced to do it, you're, you're, you're being opened up the opportunity to do that. Um, your perfect shopping centre provides purpose. We've actually refined this question in a couple of other experiments. So imagine they're building a shopping centre at the end of your street, and you got to choose what shops were in there. That has some purpose for me to now do this process. The shops, just the shops you like, I basically uh, uh, emphasise just uh, you to, to contain the protocol, make it clear that it's about what you want. Um, and then asking them to imagine those shops is actually a rewarding <coughs> process. Oh, I really quite like to have a Marks and Spencer's or Woolworths or something. Next, you know, that's, uh, um, and, and this, is the, this is the impact it has. You know, you go from five words to 13 words, and that thinking applies not just to open-ended questions, but every question in the survey, you can stimulate better thoughtful feedback by understanding that protocol. So that, that's why I always talk about it. And I've got, I've got papers on this whole topic if anyone wants to explore this thing a little bit further. So, okay, so I've got um, a, a perfect survey, engaging, I've run out of time. <laughs> Skip through this hospital there. <laughs> and, uh, you've got it, everything's working, everyone's engaged. And you still face these sorts of challenges where respondents just don't give you answers that are credible and you just don't believe them. And, um, and, and when you compare it to reality, they're not truthful. You know, um, one of the things that people always claim about is that you, if you've got a tablet, everyone says yes when well, they haven't, things like that. <laughs> um, will you vote is one that people always don't claim on. Um, uh, when you ask people, do you do more or less washing up than your partner? It adds up to 120 or 30 percent when you have a total of the partner's viewpoint of your point of view. Uh, and, and so, my, uh, really, a lot of what I'm doing is trying to think about how we get, we get actually more truthful answers out of people. And it is a big topic, and I cannot cover it in it in what three minutes. <laughs> uh, these are just some of the things that, that we're playing around with that I'm really interested in. Methodological approaches. Um, I, 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 I won't tell on that. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's lots of things you can do in reframing how you ask questions. One of the things we're doing, we're interested in a project with Opal at the moment, trying to reinvent personality measurement because they're very interested in that um, for um, a lot of the work they're doing for cognitive for segmentation work. And when you take a traditional personality test, it's made up of self-assessment questions and, and you ask people think questions like this, are you a sympathetic, are you a conscientious person, are you dependent? Everyone likes to think themselves as conscientious, hardworking, nice. No one likes to think themselves as critical. Um, and it's partly because of the way that we ask the questions. We ask them, tend to ask them in, in, in Likert scales, where you have this horrible situation where you present someone with the question, are you a talkative person? And then a couple of minutes later you say, are you a quiet person? There's about 35% will say that they agree to both statements. <laughs> so you get loads of rubbishy noise in the data. So what we've been shifting to is an approach we're calling a choice-based prioritization, where you present people with personality types and, and, and ask people to opt into them. Um, and what we find is less people um, will select 
uh, chatty and quiet. They'll take and click one or the other. Not necessarily that everyone will take either. You get a little bit less data, but it's a lot cleaner, a lot, lot more reliable data. Um, and what that does is reduce these overclaimed peaks of uh, total agreement. It doesn't solve all the problems because if I present a tick list, no one's going to tick a box saying I'm disorganised. <laughs> so what we realise is that to, to, to discover certain things about things, we have to ask things in different ways. So one of the things I'm interested in is what's called silent dog analysis, which is basically looking for what is not said. Um, and uh, no one will say they're untidy, but you ask people, do you like tidying up? The people that say yes, you kind of believe that they're tidy, and the truth lies somewhere in between. The other thing we, uh, uh, we've been playing around is asking questions in slightly simpler, it's a lot more easy. If I say, are you disorganised, I'm going to say no, but if I say, well, what's your cupboards like? It's <laughs> <laughs> a little bit clearer about actually how conscientious you are. And what we realise is that if you ask lots of little questions like this, they kind of add up to the truth about actually someone's real personality. These are easier to be truthful about, a little bit more concrete. Um, the other thing we've had lots of fun with is memes. Memes are a wonderful way of humanising a survey and unlocking the truth from people, actually. This is a lovely example of um, I'm not grumpy, but it's one of the most famous memes out there. And we basically said, you know, we, we said, okay, sometimes it's a bit difficult to self-assess yourself. Um, you know, we all see that, that, that in, in, in reality. Now, we, we want, I know it's difficult, we want you to have a go at being a bit more honest about actually how you are. And what you're seeing when we add that meme, we're getting twice as many people declaring that they're moody. <laughs> Simple value of humanising a question. This is another little experiment we've been doing um, where we're confronting people's latent dishonesty <laughs> and in a friendly, sort of fun way, highlighting that we, we tend to sort of tell things that. And, and just explaining that, you know, that people do have different perspectives. And we're, this is a piece of market research. There's a storyline about this that we present with this, saying we, we, we actually want to know what you really think. And we don't, you know, we don't want to be judgmental about that. Everyone often has minority opinions. And this was to try and understand really how important things like environmental issues were involved in the shopping process. When you just ask people straight off the bat, do you buy organic, do you think it's important to buy organic food or whatever, 15% of people will say, yes, it's important. When you ask people, show them the meme up front, that drops down to what, 5%? And every metric drops down when you give them a bit of priming. Uh, I'm really stretching now, aren't I? <laughs> But I'm really a big fan of projective techniques, asking people not what I think, but what other, I think other people think. Um, and we've been using that in a really interesting way to try and predict elections by asking people to predict how their brothers and sisters will vote and whether they're going to vote. Uh, dual processing theory is something that's really, really hot at the moment. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about this, is this idea of trying to ask questions in a way that more closely mimics real life decision making processes. So instead of saying, will you buy this or not? You ask people, will you buy it or not? And then you ask them to do what you do in every situation. You have an instant reaction, yeah, I'll buy that. And then ask them to critique that, the, the, that decision. Is it right? Is it wrong? What, you know, what strengths and weaknesses of that decision? And then ask them again, but in a more digested process. So that if that's like more mimicking the real life shopping process. And what we're finding is up to 30% of people will change their mind. And looping into the final bit, the one big area we're doing a lot of work in is, is using linguistics, understanding what people are saying can be a lot more revealing than asking people a list of option choices. You know, why do you buy shampoo? You present people with choices like this, and a lot of people just tick random boxes. If you ask people an open-ended question, why you buy shampoo, and analyse it, text analyse the, the feedback, you get a lot more nuanced differentiation of opinion, very little correlation between the two answers approaches. A lot of more honest answering. Very few people will spontaneously tell you that they're, they're mentoring, they're mentoning anything to the environment when they make it, you know, ask them in a spontaneous way. So we're really, really big fan of that. So what we're doing is a, is a sort of global exercise to try and map out the language of <coughs> shopping. Um, and we're building linguistic taxonomies to empower chapters, protocols a bit more efficiently. Um, so that's me, I'm sorry, a bit overrun a bit. But there's lots of things you can do, lots of things we've been doing, lots of things you can do, work on simple stuff. Uh, recognise this, that a survey is a reading challenge. Um, do everything you can to re reduce repetition and be a bit more human in your approach to asking questions. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>